Okay, the next question is, um, you know, how to care for this, this kind of a bird? Well, that's a really big question, and, and, and that's going to take a long time, but let me try to make it as, as simple as possible, because I'm, I'm not, at the moment, teaching a class on falconry. I'm, I'm just trying to explain a few things. First of all, these are terrible pets. Um, these, these can be extremely violent, they can be extremely dangerous. Uh, birds of prey, if handled inappropriately, um, it, it's, it's just a disaster. So, you, you first must be a, a licensed falconer, which means that you have to pass a written test, you have to have your facilities inspected, you have to um, basically have all of your facilities inspected, and then you have to apprentice under a general class or master class falconer for two years. It's very important to um, associate yourself with a really high quality master falconer um, through your apprenticeship so you learn the skills necessary. Now an, an animal like this, the, the first thing we have to do is we have to feed them a natural diet. Uh, tremendously important and I, I know this is going to be hard for everybody but um, this, this is her breakfast right here. This is, this is uh, Coternix quail. Uh, we order these uh, in uh, frozen by the thousands to feed the injured wildlife that we care for plus my falconry birds and this is a quail that I've chopped up uh, to bite-sized pieces for her so that she can uh, nibble on her food throughout the day. Now one of the most important things when you're dealing with a young bird of prey like this one is um, these guys are very very food motivated and if she associates me as an if she associates me when she's an adult as the source of food uh, she could be incredibly dangerous. In fact, I've had lots of birds come in that have been hand raised inappropriately that were just very dangerous to work with. So, we don't want these uh, animals to be dangerous, so basically at this age she gets all the food she wants, foods available to her 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and, and I am not the source of the food. The food is just always available. So, first thing is an appropriate diet. Um, rats, mice, quail, pigeon, rabbits, natural food, and I am saying whole food, not meat. And so in this, in this right here, you'll see there is bone, there is feather, there is, um, you know, guts, there is, every, there is everything here that, that uh, gives her the entire, the entire animal, which gives her a balanced diet. The next thing that we have to do is, um, we have to keep them in appropriate facilities. I have, to, I have very large chambers. My largest chambers are, are 40 feet long, 10 feet wide, 12 feet high. Uh, you have to have uh, perches. You have to have bath pans like this. You have to have um, a telemetry, which is radio tracking devices. You have to have gloves. You have to have scales. You have to have all the appropriate equipment to, uh, to care for these birds and, and monitor their health. Um, and then it requires many, many hours a day of time, it, it, in the case of a young one like this, in, in socializing her to lots of activities. Um, and then once she's a full adult, uh, getting her out and letting her, letting her fly free and hunt. So this is, this is not a hobby, this is a lifestyle. Um, I've been asked many, many times over the years, um, do I want my children to be falconers? And I tell people, no, I would rather my children be useful members of society. Uh, falconry is, is complicated and very, very difficult to live a normal life and to be a falconer. And so I discourage people from wanting to be falconers unless they can really dedicate an entire lifetime to, to this particular activity. Let's see, who would care for such a bird? Well, crazy people. Who would care for such a bird? You know, you know if you love raptors as, as I do, um, you can't imagine your life not being associated with these absolutely beautiful animals. And, and, and I have dedicated my life to rescuing them. And again, please understand, without state or federal funding, uh, strictly as a volunteer. Choice of nesting material food. Well, the, the nesting material that I have in, in her little nest box, uh, this, this is, is uh, basically shredded pine and aspen, uh, which makes a good nesting material. It's lined with, with, uh, with puppy pads to absorb moisture, and this gets changed every day. Uh, it's, it's a very clean um, material to, to raise her on. Um, you don't want to raise her on newspaper or things like that for the simple fact that it's slick and if she cannot stand properly she'll splay out her feet and they'll grow, they'll, they'll grow poorly and, and she won't be able to stand up correctly, won't be able to 
be a good strong healthy bird so you have to raise them on a material that they can get traction something that uh, will not uh, wrap around their toes nothing with thread in it like like towels and and sheets and things and so this um, this aspen bedding works very 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 well uh, again the food is uh, is rats mice quail pigeons rabbits and so on uh, question about the band okay let me turn around where you can see I don't know if you can see that band or not on her leg, but that this this band right here that I'm I'm turning around for you, you can see that little band. Um, that's her federal marker, which basically means um, she she is recognized by the by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as as a captive raised uh, goshawk, not one from the wild, and um, she will maintain that band for the for her entire life, so that at any point in time, if there's a uh, 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 a game warden or a Fish and Wildlife Service officer comes up and, sit and wants to know about her. I can say, well, here's her, here's her federal marker right there, and I can show them my paperwork that shows that, that, I am, that I am legal to possess her as a falconry bird. So that, that is issued by the federal government. People asked why you named her BG. What does BG mean? Why I named her BG. Well, to be honest with you, I'm really terrible with names. Um, my my Harris hawk that I've had for 28 years, his name is Thumper. Thumper, you know that cute little cottontail rabbit on Bambi? Well, that's what he eats. So so I I, I pretty much uh, have run out of names over the last uh, 48 years. Uh, so I, I call her BG, which uh, stands for, the B is for baby and the G for goshawk. So she's baby goss or baby girl because it's a female. Uh, and as she gets older, she can be big goss or big girl. And so we'll just call her BG. So she is four weeks old, correct? About four and a half. So she's, she's a, a month old today. And they're full grown at about two months? They're full grown at, at about uh, eight weeks. Okay. Eight so, to nine weeks. So how much does she weigh right now? Right now she is 31 ounces in weight. Um, when she hatched, she was about... Uh, a, a little under three ounces. So is she going to double that size? No, she really gets the vast majority of her size in the first five weeks and then the growth rate uh, slows down dramatically. Um, at, at, the, at the peak of her growth this little girl was eating um, four full-grown quail a day and, and now she's, her growth has slowed and she's eating two full-grown quail a day. So, so the and, and pretty soon one quail will be, an, will be a normal meal for her on a daily basis. So uh, as their growth slows down, the, the need for food slows down as well. Now there was one week that seemed to be her, her major growth spurt where she gained a between, pound. Tell us. Between three and four weeks, um, you could sit here and I could, I could have turned the video camera on and you could have sat there and watched her get bigger. It was just, just, it just so amazing uh, how quickly birds grow. Uh, but they have to. They, they have to be able to uh, uh, be out in the wild and on their own very, very quickly. Uh, the wild's a tough place, and so they don't have a lot of time like humans do uh, to be loved and cuddled and nurtured and, and, and educated. You know, everything has to go very, very quickly for animals like this. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that's why so many babies you see on the, on the ground out of their nests at such a young age is because they grow so quickly. Yes, well, like I said, um, imagine three babies this size in a, in a nest the size of this, of this little tub. Um, they, they just wouldn't fit. And, and so they end up being pushed out, frequently out onto the branches. Uh, oftentimes, um, they don't have the coordination yet to walk out on the branches, and so they end up falling out of the tree. They end up on the ground. This is fine. Uh, completely normal. This is not a problem. Uh, as long as they're not in a life-threatening situation. And, um, you know, if it's a small bird like, you know, sparrows and robins and those kinds of things, and you see a baby bird on the ground, if it isn't a life-threatening situation, uh, you can pick up the bird and move it, though it has to be close to where you found it, move it into a safer place, and, and the baby will chirp and call for mom and dad, and mom and dad will continue to feed and care for it. You know, there, there's the, an old wives' tale where people think if you touch a baby bird with your hands, the smell from your hand will frighten the adult birds away, and that really is not the case. Uh, most birds have virtually no sense of smell. 
Um, and so scent's not an issue. Now it's activity. So if you climb up and you look in a bird's nest, um, it's that activity can frighten the parents and they can abandon the nest even if you don't touch anything. So when you find bird's nests, please do not climb up and look in the nest. Uh, leave the nest uh, alone, get a pair of binoculars, stay back and watch the comings and goings. It allows mom and dad to uh, raise their babies in peace and um, the babies have a much better chance of survival.